Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have another extreme compilation. And in today's extreme compilation, we have a story where Kenny has a mishap using anhydrous ammonia. Someone posted an article, so this might be okay. These quotes are worth reading if ever dealing with anhydrous ammonia. Kenny was pulling the tank of pressurized anhydrous ammonia behind his tractor when the connection between the two broke, causing the hose to pop off from the tank. Once he had mended the connection, Kenny began hooking the hose back to the tank. When it sprayed back in his face, he was wearing safety goggles, gloves, and thick clothing, but those didn't protect his lungs. I called 911, Kenny recalled. I could get enough out to say I'd been burned, and it was anhydrous. He was intubated for a week at UI's burn center and put into a drug-induced coma while doctors suctioned burn tissue from his lungs. My lungs were burned so badly that when they sent a camera into them, they were black, Kenny said. He has since recovered, but Kenny sees where he went wrong. Although he's been using anhydrous ammonia for more than 30 years, he didn't double check the hose to make sure he had drained all of the excess anhydrous ammonia from it. That's what set off the spray. I screwed up, Kenny said. I should have drained it better. So anhydrous ammonia is quite a dangerous chemical because not only is it flammable, but it's very hazardous. Oftentimes ammonia is used as a fertilizer. So in this case, this is an agricultural use case anhydrous ammonia is being added directly into the soil, but there are other instances where ammonia has been used as a refrigerant in ice rinks, for instance. There was even a case a few years ago in British Columbia where people ended up dying as a consequence of exposure. There are a lot of instances of ammonia causing deaths, and Kenny was lucky that he recovered. This was also done outside, but you can see even though this was done outside, Kenny was still exposed to a gas and it was still able to cause significant damage to his lungs as a consequence of the exposure. Not a chemist, but remembering my old barista job, worked under the table, got my tips dipped into by my boss, wasn't told when I'd be off until the hour before I thought I was going to leave, yada yada. My last day of work ended during our always very rushed closing shift. I was being rushed around to hell and back, so needing to handle food after putting bleach into a mop bucket, I didn't have time to wash my hands, so I quickly used sanitizer. Hands started burning from chloroform. In this case, I think it was probably ethyl hypochlorite. The reaction of bleach and ethanol would produce ethyl hypochlorite, but it could conceivably form other chemicals which might be hazardous to the skin. Without knowing specifically what hand sanitizer they were using, it's hard for me to precisely say what would have happened. Luckily, I was smart enough to run my hands under cool water. No lasting damage, but my hands were raw and red the entire week after. Let's just say my resignation was me just running out of the store the beginning of the very next shift because I couldn't take it anymore. It's always a bad idea to mix cleaning chemicals unless you have a procedure that very clearly states that it's safe to do so. People talk about mixing bleach and ammonia so much and why you shouldn't do that, but there's a lot of other combinations of cleaning products which you are not able to safely mix. Please do not mix cleaning chemicals. Literally two days ago, I accidentally jabbed myself with a syringe of N-butylithium. Just hit myself with an argon bubble, no issue, and in my confusion, let my reflux apparatus build up too much pressure and blasted me in the face with THF, tetrahydrofuran. This is not a good situation because THF is an organic solvent, and I'm going to go out on a limb and guess face has a bit of solubility in THF. But hey, I was working in a fume hood and was wearing my goggles. Was completely fine, just very dizzy and lightheaded for an hour or so. So yeah, I love research. Quite often when we're doing lab work, we get exposed to all sorts of hazards. We also get exposed to chemicals that most people wouldn't get exposed to, so the safety data on these chemicals isn't always very well established. A lot of the time when we're doing chemistry, exotherms can happen and this can also make chemicals spray everywhere. So yeah, not only did this person get stabbed with N-butylithium, something that's gonna react with you but probably don't get that in you because that's bad, they also got blasted in the face with THF. So. Not a really great situation here, and if you're a chemist, you'll know how scary this situation is. Back in high school, we had the topic of chemical recycling. And for that, we were given an assignment to do an experiment of our choice, where we were supposed to recycle something. I immediately thought of Niall Red's video about extracting gold from electronic waste, and decided that that would be a cool thing to do. He broke the process down into three steps, calling for concentrated hydrochloric acid and 3% hydrogen peroxide in the first step to make a 2 to 1 to 3 to 1 solution. However, he added that the ratio was not that important, and I interpreted that I could deviate from that ratio. The next step would be to let the electronics soak in the solution for about a week, and I activated my monkey brain and thought to myself, if the hydrochloric acid is already concentrated, why don't I just use concentrated hydrogen peroxide as well, and by that reduce the time needed for the electronics to soak. Oh no, this is, this is not sounding good. So I made a solution in the ratio of 2.5 to 1 with concentrated hydrochloric acid and 30% hydrogen peroxide. Oh no, this is going to make chlorine. But then I realized relatively quickly that this was not a good idea, because after adding the electric scrap, the solution immediately started turning deep red and aggressive bubbles began to rise. 
A short time later, the entire classroom smelled of chlorine. Oh, there we go. I first put the beaker next to an open window, and then in the fume hood and turned it on. But that didn't help much, because after a short time, the air in the classroom was so thick that every breath hurt a little. So we all just left the classroom and nothing further happened, except that the whole school smelled like a swimming pool for a day. But I definitely learned my lesson, and now double check every step I want to do. This is another reason why it's important to explicitly put safety disclaimers in every video and to not make offhanded remarks without really clarifying specifically what you mean. This is a case where someone got the wrong idea from an offhanded remark. If I ever make an offhanded remark like that, make sure you let me know so that I can pin a comment or do something to rectify the situation. And here's a video of what that looked like. Oh, this is scary. That is, that is pretty close to the window and that is definitely still going to go entirely into the classroom. Uh... For years, I was the sole chemical inspector for orthotoluidine coming into the Houston ship channel. I remember, a few times the whole plant was being evacuated into inside safety zones because I was just getting samples from the ship. One time, while the ship was in port, myself and the ship Pumpy were pulling the samples and my SCBA ran out of air midway in the sampling. But I've worked with hundreds of chemicals in my career, so it was nothing extraordinary. We transported them in rubber-coated bottles just in case they broke and its MSDS number were all four to the max. The best thing that ever happened to me was leaving that career field. Yeah, it sounds like it. Shipping hazardous goods is very dangerous, and I think a lot of the people handling those still don't have appropriate training. If you feel like you're not equipped to work with something, make sure you ask your supervisor for proper training. And if no one has proper training there, that's probably a red flag. I worked as an HVAC technician, and that involves working with refrigerants, mostly R410A. It's pretty nasty stuff. When it hits a surface, it immediately starts to boil away super fast. I'm working on this old system with a valve that's known as a king valve. They shut off the service ports on the unit so that nothing can leak out. These valves are distinct from other valves because it makes service ports not work. So then, I put my service gauges on the system to check the pressure of it. And what do you know? The gauges read zero PSI. So then I start to cut into the copper tubing with my tubing cutter. The tubing cutters cut the entire pipe at once. So once the pipe is severed, all the contents sprayed out all over me in my lap. I was about one foot away from a 7 8 of an inch line of refrigerant. It sprayed all over me and kept erupting for about three minutes. I think I was only in the path of it for about three seconds, but I still had refrigerant and oil all over my arm and all over my chest. It's an absolutely crazy thing to have a quarter of your body frozen in under a second. I jumped out of the way of that thing so gosh darn fast. The neighbor had a hose bib on the side of his house. I was just pouring water on myself for about 10 minutes before someone came outside. Luckily, my old t-shirt soaked up most of the refrigerant, so I only had major burns on one arm. When I went to the hospital, they had thought that I'd gotten liquid nitrogen sprayed on me. Having super solvent sprayed all over you is very exfoliating. When it soaks into your skin, it's like having your cells boil. Also, there's a little bit of really heavy molecular weight vacuum oil that gets on you that has trapped refrigerant that continues to boil for some time. Even short exposure of refrigerant, three to five seconds will cause severe burns and lasting nerve damage. And we all have this stuff in our cars, homes, and freezers. The moral of the story is don't go cutting into things that are under pressure. This is especially true, and I would also say it's good to avoid working on lines full of refrigerant. <laughs> Maybe that means a different career path. Maybe it means that things are properly evacuated first. And this is pretty spooky. I can only imagine what would happen if the tubing cutter gets hot and also interacts with that chemical. Hopefully we don't get another welding and phosgene type situation, but this is still like a super spooky thing to have happen. I have a lot of respect for people who work with stuff like this because this sort of thing can happen. I wonder if there's any sort of standard protocol to like evacuate and vent these lines before they just decommission them like this and start working on them. I would imagine that that's what I would do in that situation. Maybe at least like take some air and run it through. But if it's something like ammonia, that has to go somewhere. So it's good to know what your specific refrigerant is before you start manipulating it and also to know what hazards are present. Something like cyclopentane is going to be pretty flammable but something like R410A is gonna have its own hazards, making sure that there's a safety plan in place in case things go wrong. So I was making my second batch of nitric acid from sodium bisulfate and potassium nitrate last weekend, and the first batch went really well, so I decided to scale it up five times, 10 grams of potassium nitrate to 50 grams of potassium nitrate. This is following a procedure that Nerd Rage has discussed on his channel previously. Everything was going smoothly until the temperature suddenly went from 40 degrees Celsius to 115 degrees Celsius, and all of the nitric acid started refluxing. This wasn't really an issue, and I think it looked kind of cool, so I started recording it. But mid-recording, one of the joints decided to leak, and nitric acid vapors immediately escaped, spontaneously reacting with the plastic joint and turning it into nitrogen dioxide. 
I had a respirator on at the time, so I was fine. I quickly turned off the hot plate and left the room and waited for it to calm down. Looking back, it was pretty stupid as the nitric acid vapor could have somehow made the plastic clamp light on fire when I wasn't around. It was azeotropic nitric acid, so it didn't, but if it was fuming, it definitely would have. Anyway, it all went smoothly and it stopped leaking. I resealed it and started the process again. In the end, I ended up with a 64% yield. And looking at how I was expecting a 90% yield, basically like 15 grams of nitric acid managed to leak out, which was pretty scary. I've made fuming nitric acid before, and that stuff is pretty scary. It just like instantly burns a nitrile glove, and it's one of the most destructive acids I've ever worked with. Not a whole pipette, we'll do like half a mil. Here's what their distillation looked like when the nitrogen dioxide started escaping. This is a gas that you should not be breathing in, and it's definitely a scary moment. Today's Yikes Wardy goes to It's Cyan. I've got a short story about working with cyanides. A while ago, one of my colleagues was working with TMS cyanide, a much safer substitute for hydrogen cyanide in organic synthesis. TMS just stands for trimethylsilyl, and this makes it a liquid instead of a gas. Hydrogen cyanide can be a gas, but it boils around 20 degrees Celsius, and the use of TMS cyanide is often preferred, as it's slightly less volatile than hydrogen cyanide is. One of his preps included distilling off the excess TMS cyanide from the crude reaction mixture. This is just the reaction mixture after the reaction finishes, as well as the solvent for the next step. And he did this on a rotovap, which is a rotary evaporator, set inside of a fume hood. He was the last person to use that rotovap that day, and he also told everyone about it. The next day, when I was finishing a column, I was rotovapping my fractions. This just contains like solvent as well as their product. And since it was around lunchtime, I was the only person in the lab, and I decided to use all the rotovaps we had to speed it up, which included the rotovap in the hood. I completely forgot about the TMS cyanide in there, and after rotovapping off my solvent, saw the bulb was full and proceeded to directly dump the contents into a waste container. The moment I finished emptying the bulb, I realized what I'd done and immediately grabbed the bottle of 6 molar sodium hydroxide and dumped approximately 500 milliliters into the container. All I could do at that point was pray. Fortunately, I lived to tell the tale. The TMS cyanide probably already hydrolyzed in the bulb overnight and got sucked into the hood when I used it the next day, but this was probably the closest I'd been to killing myself. I've done a few different reactions, or made a couple different chemicals which unintentionally released cyanide before. One time I made this one chemical that was like an SCN type compound, like a thiocyanate, but that stuff was not stable. It turned out that it generated hydrogen cyanide, and that was the day I figured out that I could indeed smell cyanide. Somebody ended up reporting this chemical to be used in a paper later, and their solution was to work with it in a glove box. So maybe somehow oxygen reacted with the thing that I made, and it made cyanide. But yeah, cyanide super spooky, do not recommend. Not a very bad incident compared to some of the other stuff on here, but this is my chem incident story. I operate chemical machines which process a variety of chemicals that you generally don't want to touch or get within several meters of. A few weeks ago, I was using telemanipulator arms to remove a bioaccumulating fluorosurfactant from an outer packaging container since it had been in storage. The container was passed through the airlock into the handling cell, and I opened the metal can and pulled out, to my surprise, a regular old Pyrex beaker, which had been capped and contained the compound. Although not a standard method of storage, it wasn't alarming. But what was, is that the beaker must have tilted or something because the fluorosurfactant had stuck itself onto its walls. Then, I used the telemanipulator arms to reach into the metal can and pull out the beaker. And as I had the beaker in the air, I could hear a very faint crack due to the thickness of the cell walls and I could see a crack expanding linearly down the length of the beaker. I quickly lowered the beaker, and when I placed it down, multiple grams of the compound spilled since it was plastered all over the beaker walls. I do have photos of this. By the way, this is the stuff that we are hearing on the news now about it being in the rain everywhere on the planet and being in everyone's blood. Now, I personally don't know if the manipulation of fluorosurfactants in this regard is as warranted as the author of this post says it is, but I do know that Scotchgard is still sold in stores and Scotchgard is a product that used to contain some of those nasty forever chemicals that bioaccumulate. So if you're working with any of those non-stick surfactants that people spray on their carpet or cars, you might want to be careful because if it's one of the older cans, you might still have some of the nasty things around. I don't know what the composition of their current mixtures is, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's probably worth looking into if you're concerned about PFAS type compounds. PFAS just stands for perfluoroalkyl substances. And here's a picture of what that person's manipulator box looked like. I've never actually seen this type of box before, and if you use this sort of thing in your industry, I'd love to hear more about it down in the comments accidentally spilled a little reaction mixture that had thiols in it. One minute after, 
This email got sent out by the building manager. I received the below email from my PI. Is this us? Faculty and staff, I have received several reports regarding a gas odor in blank hall, despite the absence of any natural gas service to the building. The odor has been traced to chemical synthesis processes taking place within the building, involving the use of a sulfur compound. Please note that this situation does not pose any immediate danger or risk to individuals. I am working with campus facilities to investigate why the smell is being recirculated instead of being properly exhausted. We're working to correct the situation as quickly as possible. Thank you to everyone who has taken the time to report this odor, and thank you for your patience as we find a resolution. As a sulfur chemist, I experienced similar situations many times. I was definitely the scapegoat anytime there was any sulfur smell, even if I wasn't working with sulfur chemistry that particular day. I didn't do too much work with thiols, but I did make some other nasty smelling ones. For the most part, I worked with thiocarbonyls, which are a bit like carbon double bond oxygen, but instead we have a carbon double bond sulfur. I'm the alpha subunit. You're the beta subunit. We are not the same. I'd like to take a moment and thank all of the Patreon supporters who make it possible for us to continue this series. We used to make these exclusively available on Patreon, but due to popular demand from the patrons, we're making them publicly available to all of you. If you'd like to get your name at the end of the next Extreme Compilation, you can support the channel on patreon.com slash thatchemist. I'll include a link to that in the video description. And this time, I'm going to say the name of all of the patrons at the end of this video as a thank you. Addicted to Chloroform, Alex, Andrew Leggan, A Person 723, Area, BD Nugget, Bryce McFarland, Chandler Smith, Days and Wave, Dominic Laver Laverg, I can't say your name, I'm so sorry, Dominic, Drewski Bruski, Duke of Wyoming, El Nombre 91, Eric Scholem, Hausmeister, Hedda or Hida, Hunter Corsomo, Interfelix, Jack Alley, Jacob Kohler, Javascriptor, JH, Julius Jarnhog. She's actually the first patron to ever support the channel, so I feel even worse about not saying your name properly, Julia, but thank you for your continued support. Justin G, Karen Rose now. Lion Lynx. Thank you, Lev. I really appreciate your support, and it was nice meeting you at LTX. Matt Gilaro, Matt Gialurakis. I'm sorry, Matt. Meryl Waratmo. Michael. Michael Andrew. Michael Smith. No Michelangelo yet. Moonberry Jam. MS Paint XP Edition. Nathaniel Clark. Nia Peter. Nico Nicknack. Paul Rohrbog. Pav. Rebecca Murphy. Richard Harris. Rosetta Stevens. Shun. Shelby Stotts, Squids Are Us, Stephen Hennessy, Sunging Kim, Tech Tech Potato, another chemistry creator, it was great meeting you at LTX as well, Ian, Tomer, Triple A Fireball, Turbo Tom, Ultraviolet, Ustin LVO, Very Spicy Honey, William Ching, and of course, Zach Friedman. Thanks for having me at your booth at Open Sauce, Zach, and I really appreciate your support as a patron. We've been using this slide to thank the patrons in all of the past videos, and we're getting pretty close to needing a new format. So it would be a real shame if a bunch of people came and supported us on Patreon, and then we would have to start developing a new format to display all these. But seriously, thank you for your support. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do that on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.